Um, but before we jump into the text for today, I just wanted to give a little bit of review of what we covered last week. So last week was um, oh, just a, an overview of Deuteronomy and uh, some of the key themes. So we talked about the fact that Deuteronomy, as we, as we have it here, is really a collection of sermons. It's a collection of three sermons by Moses. Um, and the first sermon runs roughly through chapter 1 to chapter 4. Uh, the second sermon runs roughly from then chapter 5 uh, through about chapter 27. And then the last sermon is roughly you know, those last few chapters of Deuteronomy. And as we look at the book of Deuteronomy, uh, the thing that kind of jumps out to me is this sense of urgency that Moses has. And he speaks he speaks with an urgency and with kind of a passion that we don't see uh, in other places. And part of that urgency comes from the fact that this is uh, an important moment in the life of the people of Israel. They're getting ready to enter into the promised land. Um, this generation that wandered in the wilderness has died out, except Joshua, Caleb, and Moses. Uh, and Moses himself is getting ready to, to die. And he, Moses really wants to impress upon people the importance of, uh, of life in obedience to the covenant as they go in, because that's the only future he sees for them as they enter into the land. And so in these sermons, Moses is always kind of looking backwards to what God has done for his people, the promises that he made, the provision that he provided for them. And he also points the people backwards to remind them of their faithlessness to, the, to God's uh, law and his covenant. And so there's this looking back and highlighting those two things, God's faithfulness, the people's faithlessness, and then a looking forward to life under the covenant. Uh, and so in those three sermons, he kind of lays all that out. The second sermon in particular uh, lays out what life under the covenant looks like. So he talks about the moral law, the ceremonial law, and the civil law, too. So um, we also spent some time, this is where we wrapped up last week, talking about what covenant means. And for those of you who are here, whether online or in person, uh, we talked about what the covenant is not. Does anybody remember what the covenant is not? Okay. That's right. It's not a contract. You know, it's not a contract between equals. It is a covenant, and we're going to talk about this more tonight, which implies uh, someone who is greater and someone who is under the protection of the one who is greater. So it's that, not a contract. Is that true of all covenants? Uh, not true of all, but as we'll get into tonight, there's, there's a kind of a specific form that Deuteronomy takes uh, that highlights this kind of, it's called a vassal treaty uh, covenant. Okay. Uh, but also we talked about covenant is, uh, so it's, it's not a contract. In fact, I think a better word to think of when we think of covenant is promise because right, there's a lot of promises that are contained uh, in this covenant. It's not just, if you do this, then I'll do this, or if I do this, then you have to do that. Now, that being said, uh, there is, within the language of covenant, a strong emphasis on obedience and loyalty, and we'll talk about that, um, and fidelity to Yahweh. Uh, the other thing that, though, that the, the uh, covenant really highlights is this is initiated by God. Okay, this isn't Israel kind of approaching God and, and asking for this. This is God choosing by his grace a certain people. And does anybody remember, whether online or in person, what the two, in Moses' mind, what are the two big enemies, or the two big temptations that can lure you away from the covenant? Bingo. Good. Luxury. And idolatry. That was Jackie, yes. Uh, and so he'll he'll rail on that. You'll hear him talk about, you know, when you've eaten your fill and you've built your houses and then you say in your hearts, look what I've done, right? So there's luxury that can pull the people away. They didn't have that problem in the wilderness, right? In the wilderness, they were utterly dependent on God and utterly dependent on his daily provision. Otherwise, they'd starve. But Moses knows that as you go into the land of Canaan, it's a land of what? Milk and honey. 
and of abundance and so there is this worry that as they go into the covenant or into the promised land they're going to forget the covenant and the other really really big um, the, the really the other really big temptation away from covenant is idolatry and that's going to just be an ever present concern throughout Deuteronomy and it, it'll help explain a lot of the law that Moses uh, lays out for the people. It's not just kind of this arbitrary follow these laws. <laughs> it, they're usually laws that are to protect people and the, and the Israelites from idolatry. And it's also some of the parts that honestly are the most uncomfortable. So when it talks about devoting things to destruction and not just things, but sometimes even people, uh, and it has to do with that, that threat of idolatry. All right. So uh, that's kind of the, what we covered last week. Was there any lingering questions for anybody in person or online? If you maybe had some questions from last week that we didn't get to. Going once, going twice. All right. So let's get ready to jump in. Now, one thing. Oh. Peter or Betty, go ahead. How did he remember the, like the law? <laughs> no, he did not. Uh, I mean, well, I mean, Moses was a writer, right? I mean, and whether it was Moses writing them, and we talked about this a little bit last week, whether it was Moses writing this stuff down or whether it was Moses' disciples, and I mean that just kind of in the sense of followers or, you know, students, uh, would have done the same. Also, I mean, the other thing to consider, too, is the oral tradition in the ancient world uh, was very different than what we have today. Um, and I talked about this a little bit last week. You know, we have things written down and our memory is shot, <laughs> especially with the advent of like things like cell phones, smartphones, right? Uh, our need to recall is actually greatly d diminished. I think I brought this up last week that Plato did not like writing. He didn't like the development of writing because he said if you write stuff down, that means you don't have to remember it. So he was actually very critical of writing anything down. Um, and we have record of this, and we even have record of it in, in the modern world where you have uh, where you have societies that are kind of untouched by um, the Western world that maybe don't have writing. And when you encounter these, you know, these tribes, their oral tradition is incredibly strong. So there's kind of a dual thing. He, he could have been writing this down uh, but also the oral tradition in the ancient world was uh, very, very strong. Hi, Ellen, come on in. Oh, that's all right. That's all right. Well, and this is probably going to sound really trite, but he's a prophet too, right? So the spirit is with him and saying what God needs him to mm -hmm. say, right? Moses is the greatest prophet yep. you know, before Jesus. Yep, and, so, and we'll get to that because that – that, especially in our text for today, that's kind of the explicit claim that's made too, right? Now, one thing that I asked everybody last week uh, was, uh, I gave you the handout last week for this coming week, and I wanted you to pick out a couple questions um, that I wanted you to kind of focus on and take a look at and maybe try to answer for the class. Uh, so I want to start with one of those questions. Whoops, printed up again. Uh, did anybody, oh, uh, let's see, or maybe I didn't include that one. I didn't include that one. Never mind. We'll get to that. We'll get that in a second. But let's jump into uh, Deuteronomy chapter 1, uh, verses 1 to 8 is what we're going to cover tonight. And again, to just kind of set the scene of this, you know, 
God's people are kind of looking westward toward the promised land. They're looking west across the Jordan. If you think of a, a map of Israel, those of you online are spared of my, my drawings here. So this is a really bad rendering of the Middle East. But, um, so you have, there's a river down here in a place called um, Kadesh Barnea, and you're going to hear about that in a second. But the people of Israel have moved up here, and Jerusalem is like right here. And Jericho is here, and they're at a place on the plains of Moab, kind of right across from Jericho. And so they're looking west to enter into the Promised Land. So this is the Jordan River, okay? Um, this is the Sea of Galilee up here. So they're getting ready to enter into the, the Promised Land. They've been led that far. All of you in online are spared that horrible drawing. But kind of imagine this. They're getting ready to enter in. Uh, again, you have a whole new generation of people. Only three people have been at Sinai. Moses, Joshua, and Caleb. Moses is getting ready to die. And he wants to make sure that the people don't forget the covenant. So he's calling them uh, all, all together. And he's going to remind them of the promises. Promises that have been made. Abraham, way back in Genesis chapter 15, that had been carried on through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to Joseph through 400 years of slavery, 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. And he wants to once again impress this uh, on the people uh, before he dies. And so this is uh, the context for Deuteronomy chapter 1. So take a look at it. And as I read it, you know, as always, kind of listen for those words, listen for those phrases that jump out at you, that kind of catch your attention, that challenge you a little bit, um, that confuse you and you don't know what the heck it means, <laughs> or that words that give you comfort. Um, but let's uh, jump right into it. These are the words that Moses spoke to all Israel beyond the Jordan in the wilderness in the Arabah opposite Suf between Paran and Tophel. Laban, and Hezeroth, Vizahab. It is 11 days' journey from Horeb by way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea. In the 40th year, on the first day of the 11th month, Moses spoke to the people of Israel according to all that the Lord had given him in commandment to them, after he had defeated Sihon, the king of the Amorites, who lived in Heshbon, and Og, the king of Bashan, who lived in Ashtaroth and in Edre. Beyond the Jordan, in the land of Moab, Moses undertook to explain this law, saying, The Lord our God said to us at Horeb, You have stayed long enough at this mountain. Turn and take your journey, and go to the hill country of the Amorites, and to all their neighbors in the Arabah, in the hill country, and in the lowland, and in the Negev, and by the sea coast, the land of the Canaanites and Lebanon as far as the great river, the, the river Euphrates. See, I have set the land before you. Go in and take possession of the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give to them and to their offspring after them. Here ends the reading. Now, as we start this off, again, kind of think of those words. If you have questions or those things that jumped out at you, just be sure to jot them down. We're going to kind of just walk through verse by verse here. But the first thing I want to point out here is um, some of your Bibles may do this. Mine does not. Uh, but verses 1 to 4, you could almost kind of bracket off in that verses 1 to 4 give an introduction to the entire book. Yeah, kind of sets the scene for the entire book. And then verses 5 then introduces the first sermon you know, proper. So as you kind of think about that, verses 1 to 4 um, introduce the whole thing. Verse 5 
introduces the first, if you will, sermon. And I want to kind of start off here with something that a lot of scholars have noted about how Deuteronomy is structured, especially this first part, is that Deuteronomy seems to follow a very established pattern in the ancient Near East, and it's of a treaty or a covenant. Um, and in these, the pattern here, again, is not a contract. It doesn't seem to be, you know, the kind of contract where you have, hey, I want to buy this cow and I'm going to give you, whatever, 20 shekels for this cow. This kind of treaty was called a, a, a suzerain treaty. And basically what this meant was it was a treaty made between a king and a vassal state or a person. Okay. And the reason that uh, scholars have noted this is when they look at these Near Eastern treaties, they've noticed that they follow a very specific pattern. They usually have a preamble. And then they have a historical pro or a historical kind of prologue. And then they get into the terms of the covenant. And then they get into blessings and curses. It seems to have kind of this same basic structure that you find in a lot of contracts of the ancient Near East. And what's kind of cool is Deuteronomy follows this. Even though it's three separate sermons, as you go through, it does kind of follow this same, this same structure. So like in verses 1 to 5 of chapter 1, we really do get uh, the preamble. And what the preamble does is it lays out who's involved in the treaty. So if you look at verses 1 to 5, who's involved in this tre treaty according to verses 1 to 5? Who, who did Moses speak to in verse 1? God, right? Yahweh. And just for those who don't know, I keep saying Yahweh. Yahweh is the Old Testament. I mean, it's not just the Old Testament, but it's the personal name of God, right? It's the revealed name of God. And then the vassal is Israel. And what's kind of cool here, take a look at verse 1. It says, these are the words that Moses spoke to what? All Israel. Not representatives, you know, not one of the 12 tribes to come out, but all, everybody, you know, men, women, and children, all right there that he's speaking to. So you get the who, Yahweh, Israel, and what's Moses? Moses is just simply the, the spokesperson, the mouthpiece for Yahweh. I mean, take a look at verse, uh, oh, let's see, verse 5. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, verse 3. It says, In the 40th year of the first day of the 11th month, Moses spoke to the people of Israel according to all that what? The Lord had given him commandment. Exactly. All that the Lord had given him in commandment. But Moses is the, the mediator, right? He is the spokesperson uh, for God. So we get the, in the preamble, we get the who. Do we have the where? Yep, it kind of painstakingly, right? Mm -hmm. This is the place, and you can kind of pinpoint it again. Uh, kind of, if you have a map, just go right east of Jericho across the river. Is the Arabah is that a general name or like a region name, or is it like a specific? It's right here. Somewhere? Uh, more of a region, okay. and that's that's always the so, the, so the trouble. Arabah Yes, okay, yes. So it's not like the Arabian Peninsula? No, no, it's a little more specific than that. Yeah. And, and this is part of the, the difficulty with Old Testament names. Um, a lot of times different places will have two names. So like, Sinai and Horeb. Right. So it says here in, in chapter 1, Mount Horeb. Mount Horeb is just another name for Mount Sinai, Mount Sinai right? 
Um, and Sinai could be a name for like a range of mountains. It could also be the name of one peak. Um, you know, you get this kind of flex, uh, this flexibility. Also, like when it says Amorites and Canaanites, if you look down, you know, like in verse, what is that? Verse seven. Uh, sometimes it refers to one nation of people. Sometimes it just means anybody who's in the promised land. So it's kind of hard to pin it down. But we do get, again, the main players. We do get the place. Do we get the time? Now. <clears throat> yeah, we get it very, very specifically, right? We get it laid out, 40th year. Okay. And uh, so the preamble lays all that stuff out. And then what's kind of interesting is the next part usually is a historical prologue. And in these treaties, the historical prologue is usually recounting what the king has done for his vassal. So what is, how does this start in chapter 1? Take a look at verse 8. See, I've set the land before you. Go in and take possession of the land that the Lord, what? Swore, right? And then if you kind of trace it, if you just thumb through chapter 1 and thumb through to chapter 2 and thumb through to chapter 3, what does Moses do but lay out, hey, Israelites, this is everything God has done for you, right? He promised you this land. He brought you out of Egypt. You refused to go in the promised land, so you had to go wander in the wilderness for a bit. But you know what? God still watched out after you. And then he gave you these victories over uh, Sihon and Og, which we're going to get to in a little bit. right? And he's brought you all the way to this place. So if you want to kind of mark it out, the historical prologue is basically... Uh, boy, this is hard to handle. The historical prologue is then from you know chapter 1 6 all the way through chapter 4 verse 40 roughly and then as we talked about last week basically chapters 5 through 27 are the terms this is what the covenant looks like and then towards the end you get the blessings and the curses so it, it's kind of interesting that the way that this book is put together with a very specific kind of form. Now, here's the one of the questions I think that was on your sheet for today. Yeah, the very first question. Why do you think God would establish a covenant similar to a legal treaty with which his people were familiar? Did anybody try that question? Yeah, yeah. He's working with them through what they know, right? Um, and so when they see this treaty, this, I think, is going to highlight for them at least three things. And it may be more, but it's going to highlight for them at least three things. And the first thing is this. This kind of treaty establishes the nature of the relationship between Israel and God. The kind of relationship that it is. Okay? And what that means is Israel is to worship Yahweh alone. And to worship anything else or anyone else is treason. I think this is kind of helpful for you know, a lot of times when we think about sin, when we think about breaking God's law and his covenant, what, what's some of the imagery that we use when we talk about sin? Turning your back on God. Okay, turn your back on God. Stuff we do. Wrong stuff that we do. Maybe, you know, things we screw up. How about this? Dirt that needs to be cleansed, right? We sometimes think of sin that way. Or if you think of the Greek term for sin, uh, the Greek term literally means missing the mark, like an arrow that's shot, right? 
Now, all of those different ways of thinking about sin are supposed to communicate something. But I think it's helpful to think about sin in this way. As treason. Because, you know, if you think about, only think about sin as, you know, a stain that has to be washed out. Doesn't it kind of beg the question, well, why can't God just... Why, why can't he just make us all clean? Why does, why does there have to be bloodshed? Why does there have to be, you know... Or if it's missing the mark... Boy, why does Jesus have to die for us just missing the mark? You know, it doesn't quite carry the weight. But if you think about it this way, that sin is treason against God. That changes things a little bit, doesn't it? Sin isn't just something you kind of do uh, maybe because you don't know any better. or Sin is open rebellion against your king. And even today, treason... To, Warrants what? Death. <clears throat> so what they would have understood from this covenant language is the, is the severity of it and the urgency of it and the nature of this relationship between them and their king. It also highlights something else that uh, for them, the terms of the covenant now, as we're going to get to chapters 5 and following, this is not a democracy. This is number 2, right? This is, this is not a democracy. In other words, we don't get a say in what obedience is going to look like. Right? That the terms and that uh, the, the way that we are supposed to demonstrate our loyalty and obedience, they're set by Yahweh. They're not set by us. You're going to see this over and over, especially as we get into chapters 5 through 27, and especially when it comes to worship, because God is going to say over and over again, you are to worship at the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell. So even in things like, and I mentioned this last week as an example, if you read the book of Exodus, People are to celebrate their Passover, the Passover feast where? At their homes. In Exodus, there's to do it at their homes. Moses changes it as they go into the land. He says, you are to celebrate this at the place where I cause my name to dwell. And part of the reason Yahweh is doing this is because he wants to keep his people from idolatry. So he wants them to come together. He doesn't want them to do it in their homes. But you notice that language is really important. Where I have chosen. Not you. Where I have. Now, to jump ahead a few thousand years, the, re the Reformers actually saw this as a great, gracious act of God. Because the Reformers realized, you know, the, the opposite of... Uh, you know, when God lays out his word for us and his will for us, sometimes we have the tendency to ignore it and not do it. But the reformers also realized we also have this tendency to take it and add to it and to create things and to create things that we, acts and words and deeds that we think are more godly. And so they saw God laying down exactly what the terms are as a gracious act of obedience, in a sense, to kind of save us from ourselves, from creating more and more works that burden us. Nope, just stick with God's word and stick what he has said and how he has chosen to lay out the terms. So the second thing then is, in this treaty, the people know Yahweh lays down the terms for obedience, not us. And the last thing, and, and you know, a really important thing that they would have picked up on, is in this kind of treaty formula. It's solely because of the benevolence and grace of the king that that this whole treaty is based on. It's not based on anything that the vassal does. It's only based on what the king has done for the vassal. And you see that again and again and again and again throughout Deuteronomy. Mo Moses is going to call them back. This is what God has done to establish this. 
So God is saying, this is how you live rightly. These are the rules of the game. And then if you fail to do that, you are accountable for breaking the rules. And that, I mean, wandering in the desert strikes me that way. It, it uh -huh. was like, there's, a, and said, think about what hot, jumps out at you. And the thread I was drawn to was, I'm telling you very clearly what the expectations are. You do something else, it's on you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, there is a thread throughout Deuteronomy that says, you know, repent and turn back, right? And this is kind of what makes Yahweh so gracious is that there is always room for repentance and there is grace and mercy for those who return. But those blessings and curses are real, right? I mean, if you reject the uh, the ways of uh, of the Lord, you choose death. In fact, that's how the book ends in Deuteronomy chapter 30. You have the way of life and death before you choose life. Because you choose death, and you know you live outside the covenant. Yeah. So as we as we go into this, you ask the question, Brian. So how do we, how do we know this is not a contract between equals? Because this matches up really well with this specific type of treaty that we see. So um, language between equals is different. Yes. Okay. And especially. They have language that's different. Yeah, and especially if you look at. Again, always pay attention to what Moses does with history as he looks back almost without fail. Whenever he mentions a historical reference, he's doing it to evoke one or two things, either the faithfulness of God or the faithlessness of the people or both. He rarely looks back and says, gosh, you guys did a great job back there. Keep it up. You won't find that in Deuteronomy. You'll find him looking back and saying, golly. Look at what you guys did. You know, God brought you all the way up to the border of the promised land. Some spies came back, and just because of what these spies said, you all lost faith in God. But God still took care of you, even though you wandered in the wilderness. Right? So always pay attention to how he's using history, because it's there to emphasize God's faithfulness. Oh, sure. I mean, you can think of, uh, especially in Genesis, you know, you get that quite a bit, uh, like in the patriarchs making agreements with one another, uh, that kind of a thing. We don't get it as spelled out as this um, because they just weren't dealing with written documents like they are a little bit later. Um, like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and, yeah. Mm -hmm. And like, yeah, Jacob and in Laban, you know, and, and so we do get these kind of contracts that are not spelled out in written form, but we get kind of an oral form of it. And you said uh, this type of contract begins to reign? It's... Or covenant, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. That word is really good. Yeah. Okay. Jerry, you had a question. Go for it. Here, let me, I mean, I'll write it in here. So this is the specific kind of treaty, and all you guys online can see it. Uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Possibly. Possibly. Yeah. 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 Well, and there is a sense of, we'll get into this too, that, you know, this comes up throughout the Old Testament. That part of the language of treaty is, or I'm sorry, of, of these, these kind of covenants, is the public nature of it. And, and so it, it bears witness. Um, and you, you see that language throughout the, the Old Testament of the enemies of God saying, hey, where is your God, right? Uh, the, the Israel has become a reproach uh, to Yahweh because uh, they're kind of making this whole covenant look bad. <laughs> <laughs> and by their behavior and by their idolatry. So yeah, there may be a kind of a public witness element to it too. So let's let's jump in and kind of go verse by verse here. Um, Carol, are you keeping track of how far we're getting? I hope. She always gives me a hard time because we go slow. So, um, but let's take a look, and we'll just kind of move pretty quickly here through these uh, these eight verses then. Um, Verse 1, these are the words that Moses spoke to all Israel beyond the Jordan in the wilderness, in the Arabah opposite Suf, between Par and Tophel, Laban, Hezeroth, and, Diz and Dizahab. Uh, again, just something to kind of uh, to note. Again, all Israel, all Israelites are assembled. And also, again, the geographic information, all part of that, uh, that treaty formula. Um, and again, right across the Jordan, kind of almost parallel with Jericho. And then we get a really interesting thing here in verse 2. Take, take a look. It is 11 days' journey from Horeb by way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea. One of the questions I had, I think on the sheet, was why does he mention this? Question number three, did anybody take a shot at this? So we know that they didn't need to spend 30, 40 years in the desert waiting to cross. Yeah, yeah, it's it's wild, you know. Uh, again, if you have a map and you know, take a look at it, but from Sinai, which is you know down at the end of the Sinai Sinaitic Peninsula, up to uh, the southern border uh, border of the Promised Land at Kadesh Barnea. It's 11 days. Which is about 200 and 300 miles. Well, even less. It's probably about 150. Okay. Yeah. So it's 11 days. How long have they been waiting? 40 years. 40 years. Right? So again, thinking about how Moses uses history, what is he pointing out? You screwed up, right? It's it's all because of the faithful faithlessness of the Israelites that they didn't go directly in. And he'll get into the story about the spies going over, right? But 11 days is kind of a reminder, like, come on, guys. It's 11 days journey, and it's been 40 years. But it's also a reminder of, of God's graciousness in protecting them for 40 years, right? And even the that language of, you know, reminding them of Horeb, what happened at Sinai? You see the law, Ark of the Covenant. Right. I mean, all of it, just even the mention of Sinai is a, is a reminder of the graciousness of God. So, again, whenever Moses references something historical, it kind of has a dual purpose, pointing out God's faithfulness, but also uh, the faithlessness of the people. Peter and Betty, go ahead. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a good question, and we're not quite sure. We're not quite sure how many, and we're not quite sure the, necessarily the mechanism either. Um, but yeah, that's a good question. Research it and write a five-page paper <laughs> and bring it next week. <laughs> 
Mm -hmm. She lives with some wilderness tortillas. Is there any possible uh, symbolic significance of 11 days? Or is it just simply, it's the amount of time? It, uh, it's just the amount of time. That's right. Yeah. So you haven't come across any symbolic thing for 11 days? No, I'm sure some church father did, though. Um, they always came up with symbolic stuff. But it's, it, seven, it's seven plus four. Yeah. But it is about 150 miles, and given the kind of they've actually trekked it out, and you know, that's about 11 days. Yeah. And just and that's an important point here too, Brian. It, as you get as you read through this, the historical reality of what Moses is talking about is so important because he's going to repeatedly point to history to say, look at what God did in history. You know, this isn't mythology. Uh, you know, it's not like the battle of against Sihon and Og were symbolic of something else. No, it was actually God intervening in history to save his people. So there's a historical reality there. And we may have things we need to work out in terms of a historical reconstruction of what that looks like. But we shouldn't miss that, right, that God acts in history. Um, Sometimes symbolism is fun, um, but you can't. We're can't going through Revelation right, right. Now, right? But but the way Moses presents it, right? This is not symbolic. This is, there's historical reality here that he wants people to remember and recall. So one question I had on here, and it's not really a textual question, more of just kind of a faith question. Um, question number four. Does anybody? work on this one. The Lord delayed Israel's entrance in the promised land for 40 years. And this was also recorded back in, in Numbers, actually chapters 13 all the way to 14. He sometimes delays things in our lives. How might these delays prove beneficial? Anybody tackle that question for us? I didn't, but it'd be like something you want uh, a car right away and maybe you want to go and get, but it's beneficial that you don't have it because you're not really equipped for that um, purchase, you know, monetarily or um, just you're not um, um, you're wanting or you have to pay for it. Right. You know, to deal with the, I, I have a son who's getting a driver's license right now, right? Well, I'm sure he's well equipped to take the defense. Uh, well, you know, wait, there's a difference, you, you know. I mean, all of you who have taught kids how to drive, you've had this moment of sheer terror. But yeah. when you, they want to get their license, and but there is that moment they get behind the re wheel and realize, gosh, what I wanted is terrifying. terrifying. It comes with a lot of responsibility, right? And so sometimes that delay is good for us because we need to actually mature, we actually need to learn before we can handle it. Well, Diane? Yeah, I have, I have uh, time frequently allows us to gain perspective and develop better understanding of the importance of following God's will. Sometimes mm -hmm. you jump into things and that isn't your top consideration and you don't really have a context for something that you may want. And then this the time just gives you time to step back and say, well, if I can't have that, what am I going to do? Yeah. Yeah. And, and think about it, and really, it gives you a chance, a pause, to ask if your priorities are in the right place. Yeah. Yeah. Jerry, go ahead. Right. Mm hmm Mm-hmm. 
Well, that's pretty close to what Paul says. I mean, yeah, Paul, yeah. pretty, pretty direct with that language. Mm-hmm. Yep. It, and the psalmist talks this way uh, kind of repeatedly in, in the psalms. They talk about the wilderness as a time when God made Israel his people. It, it, was, it was that time at which God actually made Israel his own, not just, not just at Sinai, but actually in the wanderings himself. So it was that process of adoption uh, through the whole time. They needed that. And I like the way you put that, Jerry. There's preparation and purging, both, that needed to happen. Yeah. All right, let's keep going here with verses 3 to 4. I want to get through 8 tonight, so uh, we're going to make it. You have six minutes. Six minutes. We may go over. All right, so in the 40th year, on the first day of the 11th month, Moses spoke to the people of Israel according to all that the Lord had given him in commandment to them. Again, and this is, again, very significant in the Old Testament. You know, we sometimes have this vision of a prophet as somebody who, you know, tells the future. That's part of prophecy. That's not, that's not all of prophecy. In the Old Testament, a prophet is just simply someone who speaks for God. And so Moses, in that respect, is kind of a, the model prophet. You can actually go back to Deuteronomy, or we'll go to, to Deuteronomy 18 to kind of flesh that out a little bit more. But so Moses is the one who speaks for the Lord. And, and again, this is important. Be, and we talked about this last week. Um, but because this has divine authority, that means these, the implications of the covenant don't change. Right? God who makes this covenant doesn't change, which means even though it's a new generation, it doesn't change. Even though this uh, new generation wasn't at Mount Sinai, the covenant was made with Israel, and even though it's a new generation, it still holds. God is still true to his word. So when it says that uh, the Lord gave Moses the words, that's assurance that the, co the covenant still applies, still stands. Um, so, oh, whoop, I didn't finish there. Uh, so the Lord had given him in commandment to them, and after he had defeated Sihon, the king of the Amorites, who lived in Heshbon and Og, a great name. Somebody's got to name their kid Og someday. Og, the king of Bashan, who lived in Ashtoreth and Idre. Uh, so did somebody answer the question, who is Sihon and Og? Question number five. Go for it, Linda. Good, good. My brother is six foot four, and I'm five ten, so maybe that's just how tight it is. Yeah, and, and you're right, Linda. This comes up repeatedly. You find Sog and uh, or Og and Sion in the Psalms as, "Hey, remember when the Lord did this?" So who were we got a good report on who are Sog and Og and Sion? I'm going to get that right. Why would Moses include them in this little? Because it demonstrates what God did. He defeated them for the Israelites. Bingo, right? It's all part of this 
kind of the historical prologue, right? Reminding them, reminding the Israelites of what God had done. Uh, and there's also not just what the, he had done, but there's kind of an implied promise of what? If you've already defeated these two guys, you get any God's going to take care of whoever's going to you're going to meet when you cross the river. Right? So there's this kind of implied promise in that language too. Um, and like I said, it's we're going to get the full story of Sihon and Og in just a couple chapters. So we'll we'll you did a great job, Linda, uh, and we'll come back to that in in just a chapter or two. Peter or Betty, go ahead. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Uh, with that, let's get to verse 5. All right. Uh, verse 5, beyond the Jordan in the land of Moab, Moses undertook to explain this law. A couple of things uh, about this verse. It seems like kind of a little, almost kind of throwaway little phrase. There's so much packed in here. Um, first up, our English translations do not do justice to the urgency here. In my translation, it says, beyond the Jordan in the land of Moses, or in the land of Moab, Moses undertook. The, the Hebrew word there is much more bold. Uh, in fact, it's the same word that's used uh, when Abraham is interceding for Sodom. Do you remember that story way back in Genesis? You know, if there's just a, a certain number, right? If there's five, if there's one, right? This is the exact same uh, verb that Abraham uses when he says, you know, I have been so basically so bold to talk to the Lord. So when, when Moses undertakes to explain the law, he's not just beginning to explain it. There's a sense of boldness, right? And he's, there's urgency behind it. And then that verb explain is another interesting one too. Um, explain is such a terrible, it makes it sound like it's just a, a lecture that Moses is giving. This is anything but just a normal sermon. The word for explain there actually means to engrave. And there's kind of a, a neat bookend to this because at the beginning, he's seeking to engrave the law on the hearts of the people. And then at the end of the book, what do they actually do? Engrave, they engrave the law on stone right, as a monument. So there's this, uh, there's the, again, this boldness and this intention for Moses to make this utterly and completely clear for the people. So he's going to explain it as boldly and as plainly as he can. And I think that accounts for that. You see that in the language, right? That's why you have blessings and curses. Not a lot of nuance, right? He's going to be bold in what he has to say. And he's going to be bold not just in, in the stuff that people want to hear, the promises. He's going to be bold in what they need to hear which is also the threats and the curses too. Um, so that's kind of important. And also, it says, Moses undertook to explain this law. Again, I think this is a terrible translation. Uh, the Hebrew word there is Torah. And Torah simply means instruction or teaching. When we hear the word law, what do you think of? Yeah, you better do this or else. You think of command, you think imperative. And, and a lot of times when you hear law, you think of punishments that are associated if you don't do it. Throughout the Old Testament, Torah can be used of commands, can also be used in terms of grace, right? So it's, it's, it's not just this law of what you have to do. The law includes what God has done for them. Um, so, beyond the river in the land of Moab, Moses boldly sets to engrave upon the hearts of all the people of Israel this gracious instruction. Okay? That might be a better translation. That's the eggled <laughs> translation. And so then the sermon actually begins in verses 6 to 8. Oh, sorry, Peter, Betty, go ahead. <laughs> 
That's not just what I said. That's actually what the Book of Concord des describes the law as. Yeah. <laughs> and and we do use law in, I mean, especially in New Testament, the word law gets used in a lot of different ways. Um, and, and so when, like, when Paul uses the word law, that kind of immutable will of God kind of is the, I think is a very, very good definition. Um, when Torah is translated, I think a broader sense of instruction is helpful because instruction can be given, right? Law is usually given by an authority. Instruction is given by whom? A teacher, a parent, right? Um, and I think that's more of the kind of relationship that's set up. All right, verses six to eight. Here we go. Buckle up. Uh, the Lord our God said to us in Horeb, remember Horeb is what? Sinai. Sinai. You have stayed long enough at this mountain. We're going to come back to that. I love it. Turn and take your journey and go to the hill country of the Amorites and to all their neighbors in the Arabah, in the hill country and in the lowland and in the Negev by the seacoast, the land of the Canaanites and Lebanon as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. See, I have set the land before you Go in and take possession of the land that the Lord swore to your, your fathers, to Abram, to Isaac, to Jacob, to give to them and their offspring after them. Right? You hear the, the directions. Move on. Take possession because of what the Lord has promised. Right. So again, kind of emphasizes all of this is based on the divine initiative on grace. It's not based on how well you've done all this, but this is based on the promise to Abraham and Isaac. And, and I love how Moses puts it. Uh, um, go and take possession of the land. In other words, Moses sounds like a good Lutheran. It's already yours by virtue of the fact that you belong to the king. It's already yours. All you got to do is what? Go take it. Go get it. Of course, it's not going to be as easy as that. <laughs> but that's the idea, right? It's already yours. God has promised it. That word is as good as, as done. Just go take possession of it. One of the questions I had here, anybody venture an answer for verse 6? What did God mean by saying you have stayed long enough at this mountain? <laughs> yeah. Not yet. Oh. Not yet. So remember, this is they're at Sinai. So uh, to go back to verse six, it says, "The Lord our God said to us at in Horeb." In other words, when we are at Mount Sinai. Right after they'd been at Mount Sinai for about a year. Remember, they had received the Ten Commandments. You got the the golden calf. You got the new set of Ten Commandments. You got the Ark. You got the instructions of the Tabernacle. Right. And so when they're at Horeb, he says, "All right, you've been here long enough. It's been a year." Go get your leaf. Mm -hmm. Go wander. You've been at the mount for a year already. Mm-hmm. The, the, the Hebrew here, I love it. It puts it this way. We translate it as you have stayed long enough at this mountain. The Hebrew actually says to stay at this mountain is too much for you. Remember what happens when Moses goes, he go, Moses goes up to the top of the mountain for 40 days, right? And how are the people doing when Moses goes up there? They're freaking out, <laughs> right? Because what do they see? See, yeah, and they hear thunder, and they see lightning and fire, right? And don't touch the mountain, because what happens if you touch the mountain? You die, right? There's all of this going on. And I just love how everything is directed by the Lord. Uh, this is long enough for you to stay here. 
It's not up to you, Israel, to decide how long you're going to stay here. Because you guys don't know what's good enough for yourself. I'm going to direct you. And so all of God's people and all their time is in the hands of the Lord. Stay here is too much for you. Follow my word. And they go. Right? Uh, and then this is an easy question. So question number eight. Did anybody venture a, a guess for question number eight? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, question number seven. It's about verse number eight. Anybody venture a guess for question seven? Wouldn't be anything like the promised land, would it? Right. <laughs> what, what promise did God make? I've already given this to you. Just go take possession of it, right? Uh, I'm going to be with you. That's what the whole point of this is. Uh, be bold and go in. Take the land. One thing I encourage you to do, it depends on how much you like your Bible or not. Uh, if you want to, maybe you could run a photocopy. But with a, a blue highlighter and a red highlighter, go through and mark all the phrases that are kind of great phrases of grace. And mark all the phrases with red that are kind of more law-oriented. And it's really interesting. You start to get a visual rep representation of how much gospel there is in the book of Deuteronomy. So every time there's a little phrase about the Lord giving you land, blue, right? The Lord promises, blue. The Lord gave you victory, blue. We get this uh, sense of Deuteronomy is just all law and all command. When you start to do this, you realize, oh, wow, there's a lot of gospel here. There's a lot of promise. Um, and that's what, again, this historical prologue and preamble are, are setting you up for. Right? God has done this for you already. He's given you the land. He's promised it to you. Just out of obedience now and, and trust, follow his word. Somebody, Jerry, go ahead. Oh. Yeah, it's... It, the, the boundaries are pretty uh, abundant, aren't they? Yeah. And I don't really know of any other, like, I don't know of any place else in the Old Testament that refers back to these boundaries as being that broad. So I don't know if it's just kind of hyperbole of this big, spacious land, kind of as far as you can see kind of language, but I don't know of any other place in the Old Testament that it draws it this way. Sure. Well, and, and later, uh, and under the prophet Amos, uh, the kings under Amos actually even extended it beyond Solomon. Which is kind of funny because when you read the book of Amos, you think, oh, these are all, this is a bad time because Amos speaks so much.